So I spent several days at Rust Machinery doing tests, and then I had a collaboration with my colleagues at the International Grinding Institute and to try to understand what is actually happening uh, when you true a diamond wheel. And if you really want to look at it fundamentally, you can look at this as a grinding operation, and the diamond wheel is grinding the truing wheel. You can also look at it where the truing wheel is grinding the diamond wheel unsuccessfully because typically you get much, much more wear of the truing wheel than you do of the diamond wheel. In fact, if you want to look at typical ratios, uh, for every one cubic millimeter that you remove of diamond wheel, uh, it can require anywhere from 5 to 100 cubic millimeters of silicon carbide to pull that off. We measure something called the D ratio. The D ratio is the volume of truing wheel uh, required to remove one cubic millimeter of diamond wheel and values that we saw in our tests were anywhere, uh, like I said, between 5 and 100. And in the academic aspect, one of the things we did investigate was looking at the size of the swarf. We actually collected the swarf. We looked at the distribution of sizes of the truing grits, the silicon carbide and aluminum oxide, to see if we had mostly grit fracture or bond fracture. And from the test we did here, there was a combination of the grits fracturing themselves and the grits breaking out of the bond material. And we'll be studying that in more detail. But just a quick picture to show that some of these grits do fracture uh, and sometimes the bond fracture. So there is quite a distribution. So we are going to publish the results, uh, including a lot of the theory, um, in two articles. We're going to publish one in Cutting Tool Engineering in the spring, and then we are going to submit one to an academic journal in the spring, too. The academic one will be very theoretical, and the Cutting Tool Engineering one will be more practical. In the meantime, I am going to give you just some quick tips because I get this a lot during my customer visits. What's the best way to true? So I'm going to give you some quick tips based on what we've learned in the study. So let's take these one by one. So first of all, what we have is we have a bunch of diamonds typically held in the resin bond. It can be bit or metal also. And then we have a bunch of conventional abrasives grits, silicon carbide or aluminum oxide. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bust these guys out uh, with these guys. Now this guy is much much harder than this guy. This would be aluminum oxide or silicon carbide. This would be diamond. This guy is much much harder. So when these guys go to battle, this guy usually wins. This guy loses, but in the process we can still bust some of these guys out of there. So how can we do that? Now typically most people, at least my customers, say that truing takes a long time. How can we true quicker? also be nice if we don't consume quite as much as silicon carbide or aluminum oxide truing wheel. But how can we do this so that we can true quicker? So here are some guidelines to get you in the right direction uh, for how to true quicker. Number one, when we true, we can either do it unidirectionally, which means at the point of contact they're going in the same direction. One is going counterclockwise and one is going clockwise, which means they're both going like this. You could call this crushing or you can go anti-directional, the opposite direction. So now they're both going clockwise or counterclockwise, and at the point of contact, their motion is in two different directions. The question often comes up, should we go uni or should we go anti? You can go either way. Uh, so let's take it one at a time. So what we have is called the speed ratio, and what we do is we take the velocity of the diamond and we take, divide it by the velocity of the truing wheel. Now this is the velocity of the diamond, the surface velocity of this guy divided by this guy. Now typically this guy, the truing wheel, is going faster than the diamond wheel. So the ratio is typically much less than one. Um, but what we have is the surface velocity of this guy, meters per second or surface speed per minute, divided by the surface velocity of this guy. If you know the surface velocity, great. If not, you want to know that ratio. The RPM of this guy times the diameter of this guy divided by the RPM of this guy divided by the diameter of this guy. Now let's start with the worst situation. If these guys are going at the exact same speed and your speed ratio is 1, which means he's going a certain speed this way and he's going a certain speed that way, and they have the exact same speed, that would be pure crushing. Okay? If you have that situation, which you certainly don't want to have, the forces pushing up on the wheel 
diamond wheel or pushing down the truer get huge and then this guy starts chirping. So the further away you can get from that, in general, the forces will be less and you'll do better. So that would be unidirectional. Anti-directional, you still have the speed ratio, but now they're going in opposite directions. Okay. In general, our study found that if you want to be able to true quickly with reasonable forces, not too big of forces, it would be better to go anti-directional and you'd like to have a speed ratio of maybe around 0 0.5. Okay. So the velocity of this guy divided by the velocity of this guy is around 0 0.5 and they're going in opposite directions. If you've got the right grid size and everything else. Now we'll talk about an exception to that. But somewhere in that ballpark, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that, anti-directional, this guy divided by this guy is 0 0.3, or this guy is going about 30% the surface velocity of that guy. One caveat is that if you go anti-directional, uh, you will throw some of the swarf up into the air. So when you go unidirectionally, uh, the swarf is going down um, in both situations. But if you go anti-directional, then the swarf, uh, some of the swarf is going to go up. Maybe that's a problem, maybe that's not, but that's one thing to consider. Okay, that's number one. Number two is the size of the grit in your truing or your silicon carbide aluminum oxide wheel divided by the size of the diamond. In general, you want this guy to be about three times the size of this guy. Two and a half times, three and a half times, something like that. If you start getting to the point where these guys are maybe only double the size of the diamond, you can still do it but it's going to take a lot longer and you're going to have to consume a lot more silicon carbide or aluminum oxide. So two and a half to three and a half times. You don't want them too much bigger because if you get them too much bigger, the forces tend to be quite big on the spindle and the spindle might start chirping. And then you've also got uh, larger power requirements. There are some truing operations where you have a radius or a really a very sharp corner uh, that you need to hold. And in that case, the two and a half to three and a half rule may need to be modified slightly uh, because you will do better with a smaller grit size. So in that case, you may want to modify your grit size to maybe be one and a half to twice the size of the diamonds in the wheel. It may take a little longer. You'll just have to live with that. Uh, and if it's taking longer than you like, you can be a little more aggressive in your truing by getting a speed ratio closer to one, or at least in that direction. Uh, so maybe you need to go unidirectionally uh, if you go with a finer, finer grit, or you can go anti-directionally and just live with the fact that it is gonna take longer if you have a sharp corner to hold. And if you have a sharp corner, what you may find is that in addition to using smaller grits, you will probably want to use a smaller dressing depth or a smaller infeed depth and a slower traverse speed. So that's number one. Number two, the grade of this guy. Uh, you can find H-grade wheels super cheap. You buy them on eBay. You don't typically want to have H-grade wheels because H-grade wheels are soft. The grade is basically how hard the bond material is or how much bond material do we have holding these guys. H is doable, but not that good. We want to go I, J, K, L, M, N, somewhere in the harder range. Okay, now it's not an exact science. You can pull it off with H. We'll talk about how you can do that in a minute. But in general, you want to go to the harder range of these grits. So if H is soft, maybe K, L, M, N, something in that direction. Okay, that's number two. Now, if a good ratio of speed is, let's say, 0 0.5 anti-directional, now the question is, how fast should we traverse? Okay. So let's hold this guy steady, and then this guy rotating, going back and forth. So what you want is, you want not to necessarily think about it in velocity, but you want to think about it in terms of lead or pitch or overlap. Now what's going to happen is, is this guy starts traversing across, He's going to start busting out grits on the side of the wheel. And let's say we do a double doink in feed. So an in feed, there's single doink and double doink. Single doink is doink, 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 doink. Double doink is doink, 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 doink. Typically, you want to do double doink. 
So if you're doing double doink grinding or double doink truing, you're going to get a taper. It's inevitable. You're always going to get a taper. Even grinding operations on steel, cylindrical traverse grinding operations, get a taper. So this guy is going to get a taper. We're eventually going to level off that taper when we get close to the end, but we are going to get a taper. So what is a good velocity to have? What we want is the width of the cutting portion, sometimes called the lead or sometimes called the pitch, to be about one quarter of the wheel width. What that means is every time this diamond wheel, not the truing wheel, the diamond wheel makes one revolution, I want this guy to move over about a quarter of the wheel width. So if this wheel is half an inch, and this guy is moving back and forth, every time that diamond wheel makes one revolution, I want this guy to have moved over one quarter of one half an inch, which would be one eighth of an inch. So every time this guy comes around once, we want to move over one eighth. That will give us what's called an overlap of four, meaning that this diamond will see the truing wheel four times as he traverses. And we're going to get a taper like that. Okay. So that is how fast you want to go. Now the question is, what is better, silicon carbide or aluminum oxide for these things? Uh, some people like the silicon carbide, some people like aluminum oxide. What is the difference? Uh, it was interesting to find that our test showed that there really wasn't any difference between silicon carbide and aluminum oxide. Silicon carbide is a little bit harder than aluminum oxide. Not much. Uh, it's a little bit more friable too. Uh, but neither of them were even close to being hard, as hard as diamond. So our test showed that it really didn't matter whether you use silicon carbide or aluminum oxide, all other things being equal, of course. Um, parameters were more important than silicon carbide or aluminum oxide. All right, so now the next question is how deep do we want to go? So assuming we're doing double doink grinding, doink, zh, doink, zh, doink, zh, in general, you want a reasonable depth, and that reasonable depth would be about 1 thou or 25 microns. Thou, thou, a thou, 25 microns, 25 microns, 25 microns. That's a good reasonable number. Okay. Now, when you start getting closer to the end, you're still going to have that taper, and we got to get rid of that taper. So now what you're going to do is you're going to take that 25 microns or a thou, and then cut it down to half a thou, and then cut it down to something smaller, to remove that taper. Okay. Now, what happens if your grits, you've got a whole stack of wheels in there and the grits are too small or they're too soft? Then what do we do? We've got, you know, we bought a thousand of these wheels. We'd like to use a 60 mesh, but all we got is 120. What can we do to still use them up and not take all day to do it? Okay, so in this case, we need to be more aggressive in our truing. Okay, so the grits are so small that the forces are probably not going to be too big because this diamond is busting this guy away. So what you want to do is be more aggressive. And some ways to be more aggressive are now you can switch over to uni. If you're uni, you're going to be more aggressive in your dressing action, your truing action. And so now we can go uni. We still want to stay for away from 1.0 because that's just going to cause big forces, chirping, chatter, problems. So we want to be at a speed ratio of maybe around plus 0.3 to plus 0.5. And if it's still taking too long and the guy's not chirping, then take a deeper cut. Go to 50 microns. That'll also make it more aggressive. Okay, now when you start getting towards the end, and now you're only taking, let's say, 5 microns or 2 tenths to level that guy off, all of a sudden now you're not very aggressive in your truing operation. So what can we do about that? Maybe it's taking too long when you get to the end. You can either just kind of tough it out and say, all right, we're taking smaller depths, it's gonna take longer. What you can also do is, remember, the closer you get to the 1.0 the 1 ratio, unidirectionally, the more aggressive it gets. So in that respect, as you get towards the end, if you wanted to start moving towards the unidirectional and start moving to plus 0 0.3, plus 0 0.4, 0 0.5, you'll have a more aggressive truing action, and you will counter the effect of the small depth of cut, and then maybe be able to remove material more quickly.